Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible provides an easily accessible way to access audiobooks for its members, just one of the reasons why I recommend it, along with enabling you to make huge savings on the newest full-length Warhammer audiobooks. As an Audible member, you get one credit every month to use on any title across their entire premium selection, but clearly credits are best spent on the longer 9-hour plus premium audiobooks. My choice today is another shorter story with a one hour runtime. It's titled Binary Succession and falls into the Heresy series timeline. Despite being only an hour long, you come away with a great narrative. Shorts can be just as interesting as longer narratives, and often they contain as much worthwhile contextual information for the 40k verse. We'll discuss Binary Succession a little more at the end of this video. I usually recommend people consider purchasing shorter audiobooks as premium members get a 30% discount when purchasing, saving those credits for the more lengthy audio dramas. You can start using Audible today with a free 30-day Audible trial to get yourself full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals and podcasts. All you need to do is visit audible.com slash Luton and for those in the US you can also text Luton to 500-500. Now, I enjoy the chaotic comedy of the fact that I'm here speaking today about a civilization of the 40k verse which has not only been missing in action for multiple decades and which has been teased so far without any real or proper background, much of which lies in ruin, and more appropriately for the 40k verse is a scattered wasteland of rumours, half-truths, misremembered quotations and conspiracy. Yet, simultaneously, I still so far haven't made a dedicated Sisters of Battle overview. How this must pain some of you, but at least I share in your frustration. As today we rake through the forge and its ashen burned down law coals of the League of Votan, or for literally anyone who is not either GW or literally just joined the verse of Warhammer this week, the Squats. So we will rake through the bizarrity of the Squats lore today. But before we do, I wanted to just cut through all the fog and tell you exactly in brutally raw terms what the deal with the Squats is. For while many of you know by now that I love to see things from an immersed in-fiction, in-world perspective when it comes to 40k, the Squats are such an oddity to really get any kind of grounding. You just need to really get down to the raw detail. And in terms of raw detail, it's been amusing to see quite so many people react with even weird negativity to the factional designation League of Votan. Anyone who has even a clue about 40k lore should know that the squats were organised into what was known as the 700 Leagues. More on that later. So it's fitting, it's lore appropriate. But there's so many rumours, myths and conspiracy about the absence of the squats from 40k it overshadows everything. It's difficult to know one from another. We get so confused about the things that even already are established. It's easy to see why things would get so muddled. And as you know, I enjoy digging back through these details of eras past to find out just if there is or isn't a reference stating that such and such a vehicle of titanic scale is only a light vehicle for the Imperium. Or that, say, in Master of Mankind, I'm sure it says XYZ. 99% of the time when I go back to actually investigate this stuff, it turns out to be a dead end, to the surprise of none. So when it comes to the squats, it's very likely that anything which follows today stands ready to be shortly obliterated, as we get a, let's say, updated communication from a distant corner of the galaxy regarding the squat homeworlds. As I've stated to you all many times before, this is the pure genius of 40k. Some dismiss the fact that in the 40k verse the sheer unreliability of most recorded information is just an excuse for lazy or poor writing. It's a very cynical view, but it's not one that I think we couldn't entertain as being unintentionally forgiving at the very least. The real genius of 40k is that, as I have clarified many times, the concept of canon and retcon in the 40k verse is incredibly loose at best, if not, in my opinion, not applicable. As has been restated, as I've said, by multiple official sources, 40k is one of the very few fictional verses where they are gifted this miracle bounty of acceptable, unreliable narrative. Where through the lens of the horrifyingly oppressive and pervasive bureaucracy of the Imperium, the Inquisition, and Administratum, stand not just 
as a beautiful masterstroke of in-fiction mechanics to enable the adjustment, for want of a better word, retconning of almost anything within the 40k verse. Despite this, and despite I am sure the fear that it sends through many people, to know that basically almost anything could be altered at any time by the stroke of a pen or a key, and still be completely acceptable within the law boundaries that exist of 40k. Bizarrely, when you compare 40k to other fictional verses, now marshalled by giant rodents living in citadels, 40k has positioned itself to be curiously strong in this continuity mechanic. There are very obvious exceptions, such as the Necron and more recent shifts in terms of the timeline of the Indomitus era, but even then, these are more like chiropractic narrative treatments, where things are realigned, sometimes painfully. Yet through this incredibly convenient, unreliable nature of 40k, in the sense that much of the documented lore is never out of fiction, you can also always come up with a way to explain things away. In fact, the very reasoning here is often applied by the community itself. When something cannot be explained, people reach for their headcanon, and it works, because it doesn't have to actually be true, because a lot of the stuff that is in 40k you can't be sure of one way or the other already. And this is when people start to talk about, well, if anything can be true, then surely it doesn't matter, the whole thing falls apart. I've explained this many times, what you come down to are things that you believe can be reliably true based on the weight of accounting toward it. Basically, if enough people are saying a thing, if there is enough evidence, enough visual evidence, enough documented evidence, you have to just lean in and say, we can probably believe that this is more likely to be true. It's as simple as that. So it doesn't go that just people can say whatever they want, there are still boundaries. But at the same time, it cleverly allows you to move things around if you want. However, in saying all of that, when it comes to the squats, their unexplained omission actually pushes all the wrong buttons. And we'll get into why. Now as I've noted often before, the first edition of 40k was incredibly experimental. Some concepts that were tried in terms of the lore and characterization would get binned very quickly. These were incredibly different times. Games Workshop sort of didn't seem to know what it was doing a lot of the time, and hence why we no longer speak of the chaos god Malal, but we may speak of Malice. Something that we have explored already was pulled right through into the modern era of 40k with the Chaos Space Marines of the Sons of Malice. First edition 40k was essentially Games Workshop's effort to turn Fantasy Warhammer into a space version, hence why so many of the races of 40k directly mirrored fantasy but just with the word space in front. Space Orcs, Space Elves, and so on. The Squats were very obviously the space take on the Tolkien Dwarven race, as it had been adapted for Warhammer in the form of the Dwarves, or as now is known as the Duradin, whatever it is. But in this transition from fantasy to space, when it came to the Dwarven race, there was unfortunately just one small problem when it came to the space 40k take on those proud noble masters of construction, crafting and mining known to us as the Dwarves. But this idea that the initial squat concept was something of a failure, that's not my take on it. It's coming from, we think, the guys who actually came up with the Space Dwarves concept, the 40k concept, and I'll get to that shortly. Now as with so much of the cross-referencing to piece together and make sense of why the squats were omitted from 40k across multiple decades, importantly as I say to get down on it, you have to take a look at the long forgotten Specialist Games website which was adjacent to the main 40k game. Now I've noted in some previous Insane Weapons video this was a site that was ran to basically keep going other spin-off games from Games Workshop like Necromunda and so on. It was sort of a curious free resource but more interestingly often outward pop explanations of things related to the lore and weaponry and races of the 40k verse that was not seen anywhere else. It definitely wasn't official, but it wasn't really unofficial, and this stuff needs to be taken with a heavy pinch of salt, just as much as one might read on any community internet post forum, because technically, like I say, it's unofficial. But the fact that this site was Games Workshop adjacent gives us a little more weight to it, depending on who is actually making the post. The description about what happened with the squats is believed to have been posted by Jarvis Johnson in 2004, which we have no reason to really presume it was not the real Jarvis Johnson. He was the development manager of the first edition of Warhammer 40,000, and he worked on a lot of Games Workshop products. Jarvis explained that essentially the reason squats were abandoned was that they were just basically a failed attempt to import yet another fantasy race into 40k. 
and the too long didn't read is that in the view of Games Workshop at the time of second edition, the squats were basically too derpy and absurd, even for 40k, which is suddenly saying something. And there definitely were plans to make them a thing in the second edition of 40k, because they appear in the original second edition box set books, they even appeared in the supplement Dark Millennium books, there's references to them all over the place, but they never got their own codex. As Jarvis said, quoting, the reason that the squats were dropped was because the creatives in the studio felt that we had failed to do the dwarf archetype justice in its 40k incarnation. From the name of the race squats, what were we thinking, through to their short bikers motif. We had managed to turn what was a proud and noble race in Warhammer and the other literary forms where the archetype exists into a joke race in 40k. Now, as I say, I, I think that's a little harsh, actually, but this appears to be the reason for the omission of dwarves from 40k. The first iteration of them was just basically too stupid, and unfortunately for the squats, by the time their more impressive war machine creations in the epic game system were looking more promising, the boat of the seminal second edition of 40k had been well and truly missed. They appeared in the Codex Imperialis for second edition, like I said, but unlike the other major factions of the time, they didn't get a codex of their own, nor updated models. Even more bizarrely, they were then largely absent from even inclusion to the history of the galaxy and the Imperium thereafter. They were simply erased, expunged and omitted from all records for decades to come. This though, of course, is far from the end of the story. So now when we talk about the history of the squats, it is something that needs to be taken with a pinch of salt, because it's going to be interesting to see just how much things are realigned or if their history is kept relatively intact. Will they be instead remoulded and redefined for the age of Indomitus? Now the squats are supposedly what the Imperium unfortunately refer to as abhumans. These are humanoids different in their physiological appearance to be deemed not so offensive to the horrifyingly dystopian Imperium that they must be eradicated. Instead they're seen as being tolerable. Worth noting that the Imperium for example very actively uses other humanoid forms in its military, notably the huge Ogrins and the very small Ratlings. The original explanation of human forms diverging across the galaxy was generally due to different environmental factors of whatever planet settling humans had arrived upon. So for the squats it was speculated that their worlds had increased gravity, leading to them for whatever reason taking this smaller appearance. This is the explanation given within the 40k verse anyway, I think there's a fair conversation to be had about if that would in fact be the direction things proceeded in terms of mutation or whatever upon a high gravity world, and not for example maybe favouring humans who had say more lightweight bone structure. Still, this is not how it's set out, and the origins of the squats were said to have come from humanity's very ancient past. As the early colonisation began to occur, Earth was dying and resources had been fully utilised. Humanity had to reach out into the galaxy to acquire the materials that would propel its survival into distant millennia. So in keeping with their more fantasy kin, the squats are said to have established an underground culture upon the worlds they found themselves upon during humanity's great expansion. Coupled with a massive bounty of rich mineral wealth of the planets and systems they'd come across, the wealth of the squats discovered was far beyond just standard mineral deposits of planets, but some of the deepest and richest mixtures of substance known to exist throughout the galaxy, smelted in the furnaces of dying suns formed at the very beginning of the galaxy. The breadth of the territory of planets that they were colonising gave the squats near limitless resources. Due to the positioning of the spiral arm in the galaxy, the worlds they inhabited were surrounded by dim suns, and this lack of daylight left them barren, inhospitable, and more importantly, unsuitable for terraforming. So the colonists had to turn to creating vast underground civilizations, and this of course required large and innovative machinery to construct and maintain it. The environmental factors of their living situation and the gravity of the world is what was believed to have led to the more favourable form upon these worlds in that of the squats. Although saying that and knowing how reliable Imperial research is, it could well be any other far more technical and plausible reasoning. Unlike much of humanity which tore itself apart during the Age of Strife, 
The Squats managed to retain much of their history and importantly much of their technology. The length of time that well-kept scholarly records of the Squats cover mean that the Administratum was in the process of assessing their records at a deathly slow pace, coupled with questions about just how much access they had to the full records of the civilization. The Squat worlds were unusual in the modern Imperium of Humanity as they stood out as relatively self-governing not entirely unlike the Mechanicus. So similarly to the Mechanicum, the Squats were able to establish treaties early on that saw them not return to the Imperium under the banner of the Emperor, but to retain their cultural identity and more importantly their independence. The exchange for this was said to be in both the sheer quality and quantity of mineral wealth able to be processed for the Imperium and the supply of technology, although there may well be slightly more embarrassing reasons as well, which are less vocalised. But one of the very obvious massive benefits was that the Mechanicus were given full access to a much higher availability of STC retained from the Dark Age of Technology, plus the possibility of others as yet undiscovered, or maybe more accurately to suggest, hidden. Despite this high level of independence, the Squats are also expected to toe the line when it comes to wider Imperium policy in terms of galactic issues mandated by the rulers of the Imperium. This is generally no issue for the Squats because they have little interest in what is occurring outside their own realm. In some respects, this is no bad thing, as unlike the majority of the Imperium, they do not worship the Emperor as the deity and saviour of humanity. They instead focus on ancestral worship, the dead of their clans and their family. The connection between the living and the dead is very real for the Squats, and this helps dictate their actions in life, knowing that whatever they achieve and contribute adds to the honour and glory of those they will meet once again in death. For this reason, reputation is of critical importance, and squats will go to enormous lengths to clear their names or pay in service for any blemishes upon the character of themselves and the honour of their family names. Squats are only seen to integrate elements of the Imperial faith when they may ally and serve alongside regular Imperials, where it becomes comfortably necessary to adopt the rituals of the wider Imperium, and whilst not being directly something Squats may subscribe to, it is to them inoffensive enough with their concepts of ancestral worship that they will follow and participate with it for the better cohesion and morale of all. Where the Imperium's vast population centres evolved to become hive cities and hive worlds, within the civilization of the Squats they developed what were designated strongholds. These are not entirely dissimilar from hive cities, they developed as smaller underground population centres which over time were further developed. Unlike the Imperium, however, each stronghold is something akin to an ancient city-state in human culture. These strongholds would then join together into leagues for increased power economically and for defensive purposes. A league can contain just a few strongholds, or some of the most famous leagues were said to contain many thousands of strongholds. Each league will be headed by a high council with representatives from each stronghold, meaning obviously the larger a league, the more complex and difficult it is in its decision-making structure. This is what gave rise to the 700 leagues of the Squat homeworlds. One important league, for example, the League of Thor, was said to have had as many as 300 strongholds under its banner. Others, like the League of Emberg, contained only four. The League of Votan is not mentioned, so its size, location and strength entirely unknown. Similarly to the wider Imperium, Squats have an obligation of military service if required and can typically serve from between 30 and 70 years. But Squats have been shown to be capable of living considerably longer than humans. The reason for this could be speculated upon, but they're also usually required to bear children before being called into military service to ensure their population remains stable. It's not common, but sometimes leagues will also war with one another, leading to bitter rivalries over millennia. But still, despite this overall, Squats have a very strong sense of their responsibility to put the survival of their civilization above petty rivalries. Once their military service is fulfilled, which can be in literal defense of leagues or in mercenary activities, a Squat will return with hopefully significant achievement and honor, all the better to build a successful business of trade upon, as others will of course want to do business with those who have great achievements and a name of renown. Squat history is designated by specific ages. The age of founding, isolation, trade, war, rediscovery, and essentially lastly the Imperium. 
They are by and large fairly self-explanatory if you know anything of the history of the 40k galaxy. The first period of history within the territory settled by what would become the Squats exists more to connect the timeline than it is part of actual Squat culture. The age of founding is as it suggests, the period known to the Imperium as the Dark Age of Technology. This is when the colonists founded the region that would become the Squat homeworlds, and they would aid the rest of human civilization at this time with the wealth of minerals discovered. Squat culture began properly during what is known as the Age of Isolation. As you might guess, this is the period that saw humanity cut off from the majority of other systems as powerful warp storms prevented all travel. More commonly known as the Age of Strife, this was as devastating for the Squats as it was for the rest of humanity, although in different ways. Many worlds were lost entirely in this time. The reasoning as to why Squat civilization began to in fact diverge from that of the wider humanity is that like many human systems, the timescale and hardship of the Age of Strife would lead to many forgetting or actively concluding that all hope was lost of reconnection with the rest of human civilization, or that if and when they could, there would be nothing left to reconnect with. For the Squats, this was the time that they would consequently begin referring to their settled planets as their home worlds. The concept of a separate Squat civilization from the rest of humanity, along with its culture, would begin. During this age of isolation, not dissimilarly entirely to the Mechanicus, the Squats became heavily reliant on their technology to survive. The poor environmental conditions of their worlds meant that they needed to supply almost everything for themselves, foodstuffs and the further development of atmospheric processing for their subterranean cities. This led, as has often occurred in human history and still occurs across many hive cities of the Imperium, to the development of trade and engineering guilds. These guilds brought together in a more centralised way all the information and collective knowledge of the Squats to better maintain and defend their strongholds. As was the nature of Squat culture, these guilds soon leaned in on what could be called more research and development, leading to various machines of both war and for civilian infrastructure that exist as entirely unique for the Squat civilization. Interestingly, another purpose for the guilds has been to essentially open source the knowledge of their peoples across all of the Squat homeworlds to enable all strongholds to adequately maintain and defend themselves, and to prevent any one stronghold to wield knowledge as power. Thus, the Squat civilization, again quite counter to the Imperium, benefits from technology and the discovery of ancient tech a lot more equally, where all of their worlds will share and learn and develop together. At least, that is the principle. From an individual perspective, a Squat will always honour their stronghold, but if they're a member of a guild, engineering, trade or other, this will outweigh responsibilities to the stronghold as the dissemination of knowledge is seen as being the most critical role. The tech guilds of the Squats have been in fact so successful that it's said that they own or have designs for technology that outclass even the Mechanicus and are even beyond comprehension of tech priests, something which undoubtedly may have also factored into the reasoning as to why the Astartes and Great Crusade did not simply crush the Squat homeworlds. For example, the Squats are said to use neoplasma reactors with warp cores held stable by zero energy containment fields. Tech, at a zenith level of power beyond all other races in the galaxy and very possibly only comparable to humanity in its golden age. The Mechanicus have seemingly some schematics to work on similar power sources but their attempts to solve the problem of this tech failed repeatedly and were abandoned. Some Squats even regard the Mechanicus with levels of disdain, considering them little more than ignorant shamans, which, interestingly enough, was fairly similar to the conclusion of AI who survived the Dark Age of Technology and lived to see the subsequent horror of the 41st millennium. One aspect that has assisted the Squats in their ability to develop technology is in fact their lifespan. As the Mechanicum learned early on, one of the biggest threats to the power of technology and knowledge was not its destruction, but it was the ability to retain information, and thus the longer you could survive and pass on information, as well as an ability to gain a greater understanding of it, then all the better. So unlike humans who in the age of the Imperium have quite wide-ranging lifespans from barely 100 years to far beyond this, when they are artificially manipulated with technology and forbidden elixirs, as well as more questionable methods. By comparison, squats typically live for anything like 300 years on average, 
For a few squats, if they are capable of living into a 4th century, they are considered likely to be gifted with the stamina to potentially live as long as 800 years, some rumoured to perhaps be even as long as a millennia. This also goes to explain in some part why, despite rumours of their demise, squats have been seen in other places around the Imperium, like for example within the hive city of Necromunda. Unsurprisingly though, these ancient squat lords are treated with the highest of respect and are generally known as living ancestors. Their lives so filled with wisdom, they are of paramount importance to the running and development of strongholds, as well as advising leagues. One aspect that is barely mentioned when it comes to squats is in fact psychers. Most of humanity during the Age of Strife saw an emergence of psychers, yet for the squats, little is known. All that we do know is that their ancient living ancestors, once passing 500 years of life, seem to develop some psychic ability, meaning psychic ability amongst the squats is very rare. Why this happens and why it is so unseen among other squats is unknown, but it's likely one reason as to why the squats fared so well during the Age of Strife, whereas other planets completely imploded as their populations were ravaged by incursions from the warp. Living ancestors essentially pass beyond a need for material wealth and possessions once they reach such status. They even have funerals to mark their transition from a squat in life to a new plane of existence as a living ancestor and a rare psyker in squat civilization. Any personal wealth and trade networks are handed down within their family line and they move to live a selfless existence with other living ancestors whose sole responsibility from there on is to provide counsel and steer their stronghold to a position of stability, prosperity and safety. For the squat civilization, they had to either relearn or invent anything they needed. Questions arise to ask, for example, if the squats did not suffer the same fate as the rest of humanity, and if they had equal STC access, why did they not retain more reliable tech, reliable AI, for that matter from the golden age? The answer to this is unknown. Either way, unlike the rest of the galaxy, as it was overrun by the Astartes, the squats surprisingly stood separately and were one of the few domains left intact by the bringers of destruction to planets who resisted the will of the Emperor. The Age of Trade eventually came. This was when the squats were able, thanks to the decreasing intensity of warp storms, trade outside their own systems. Although this was unfortunately limited mainly to Xenos in the case of both Orc and Eldar. The Eldar curiously were less hostile as were seemingly the Orcs in this period as was the case also for humanity, but initially the squats would face threats from emerging orcs and had to learn to defend themselves, where previously the wider human civilization had supported them, this is what in part led to them developing weaponry and concepts for militarization, and a key difference comparative to the Mechanicum and for that matter human civilization which had lost vast amounts of knowledge regarding advanced technology and any which remained became obfuscated by the religious cult that would become the Mechanicum and its cult Mechanicus. The squats went in an entirely different direction based more around logic, free thinking, invention. Eventually trade was made possible with the Eldar and even the Orcs who perhaps in the short term saw the benefit of such arrangements. But it would be the Eldari who exchanged the most with the squats, who, unlike their xenophobic kin that followed later at the behest of the Emperor, the squats were being open to cultural and technological exchange with the Eldari with this more free thinking outlook. And it makes sense when your culture retained seemingly much that had been achieved during humanity's golden age and hadn't descended into a nightmarish cult religious apocalypse, who through continual assaults by horrific beings both mortal and not, led your planet to become fearful of basically anything that isn't explicitly human, and even then best to be sure. So this open-minded outlook of the squats was initially considerably beneficial, but working with the Eldar they were granted access to technology which enabled them to construct and disseminate among strongholds some of the most advanced and efficient hydroponics in the galaxy. Must be nice, said some anonymous imperial pleb peon in the depths of a hive city as they crunched through a rancid tin of amble meat. Still, you reap what you sow. Perhaps the Imperium could be in less of a dystopian catastrophic state if it spent more time reading its archives of human knowledge and less time censoring, burning and executing those who suggested maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing to find new ways to help the population. Still, rose-tinted glasses on, unlike the Imperium after the heresy, the squats actually followed a path more in line with the Emperor's original vision. 
not what it would morph into as a nightmarish totalitarian theocracy, or roughly speaking anyway, because the Imperium is far more complex than that and not for the better. Not the Squat civilization though. They chose a different path, and they were better for that, in the short term at least. Toward the end of the Age of Trade though, it seems that the Orcs had sat around long enough. Orcs will only enjoy trading so long before all of that trade likely creates a domino effect of scrap surplus, and so a massive Orc war fleet would bring this period of prosperity and peace to an end and mark the Greenskins as an enemy forevermore. The end of this Age of Trade came to mark a new period known creatively as the Age of War. The Orcs waged war, but to their surprise the Squats would eventually repel them. Sadly not before many strongholds were lost and information about this period is scant, but it's believed that the Age of War for the Squats was fairly devastating. When all was said and done, the Squats found themselves with now two enemies, the Orcs for assaulting their domain and the Eldar for having done nothing to aid them who had seemingly been content to sit back and watch what had potentially been a slippery slope into total annihilation for the Squats, so basically predictably Eldari. The betrayal of both Eldar and Orc would not be forgotten by the Squats in any short time frame. The Squats' last marker period, now known as the Age of Rediscovery. As warp storms abated, they reconnected with the rest of humanity. A considerably important question though remains unanswered. Why were the Squats not forcibly reintegrated as part of the Imperium? While it's true that they had considerable resources and knowledge, this is not unlike many planets, systems and cultures the Imperium rediscovered during the Great Crusade. It was not unusual for the legions of Astartes and the massive fleets which came with them to spend significant time and resources forcibly occupying and converting lost colonies. Those who resisted would do so until the point patience was expended and their peoples and culture purged, often violently. The Squats were by no means unusual comparative to many other lost Imperial civilizations. In the original history available to us there is no explanation or even suggestion as to why this did not occur. We might speculate that it was considered too destructive so as to be counterproductive, but that rarely happened during the Great Crusade. Even cultures that had enough power to very actively resist the Astartes were eventually subdued. Still, it is stated that the Mark III version of power armour was actively created for use in close quarter environments after legions were said to have suffered heavy losses. This perhaps in part explains why the Squats ended up surviving independently. Perhaps they had the ability to resist the Imperium far beyond what has been documented. We'll have to wait and see if more will be revealed to us soon enough. The Squats were said to be unusual already comparative to the rest of the Imperium because while most of humanity appears at this point to be barely educated beyond the ability to function in their daily tasks of industrialised living, Squats are commonly adept with technical proficiency. This is due to their entire society focusing around technological development and maintenance, trade, economics and so on. So unlike the bulk of the Imperial Guard, Squats can repair and use their initiative to find solutions to problems on the go, in battle and wherever. This gives them much lower rates of equipment failure and less dependency on specialists, meaning they're not as technically compartmentalised as say the Imperium and even the Astartes who rely nearly entirely upon the Mechanicus. When it comes to technology, despite them being well renowned for their adept skills, very little is seen of the Squats at an individual level other than their Exo armour, which combines elements of the power and tactical dreadnought armour of the Astartes. It's worth remembering that when the Great Crusade occurred, the legions encountered at least several worlds with iterations of powered armoured suits, which is suggestive that it was not the Emperor who singularly created the concept and technical design of power armour suits, but that they likely originated from a design long lost in the history of humanity and the Dark Age of Technology. So it would be entirely reasonable that the Squats should also have access to an iteration of such. However, over time various new patterns of Space Marine power armour have been developed to specifically tailor to the needs of the Imperial Astartes. Remember, the Mechanicus do not allow for full-blown breaking of their ideological outlooks when it comes to technology, but certain levels of bending and sideways movement are tolerated when it comes to refreshing hardware. Additionally, Squats use their own version of power armour much more like it was presumably originally intended, as an industrial environment suit, for use both underground and on the surface of planets, where conditions are hazardous and inhospitable for the likes of a humanoid. The Squats are not seen to have massive amounts of armour as well, as you might see with say the Imperial Guard. 
but again, much of their capabilities remain a mystery. They do use these massive land trains, which were intended for the industrial trade purpose, but also have been adapted for war reasons and are gigantic weapons platforms capable of traversing the most inhospitable of planetary surfaces. There are also, of course, rumours of them having sizable space vessels with technology that once again is a mystery to the Imperium and Mechanicus. There do appear to also have been exchanges of technology with the squat homeworlds that persist. The Imperium, for example, may sometimes deploy a rarely seen gigantic vehicle known simply as a Leviathan, commonly confused as well with a capital Imperialis. The connection to the Squats is that it looks incredibly similar to the Squat Colossus and Cyclops machines used by them in war, and the reason is that very likely, as with so many Imperial tanks, it uses the same STC base. It's said this occurred as an exchange between the Imperium and Squats, and the Leviathan is a mobile, super heavy command platform featuring immense levels of armament. The Leviathan joint project between the Imperium and Squats gives you a sense of what could have been achieved in the long term and how important the Squats were. For example, a Leviathan is protected by four Titan class void shields. Meters thick armor, it stands over 90 meters tall and has enough capacity for two full companies of Imperial Guard and hardware to support them. On board landing pads for Valkyries and extensive communication and intel infrastructure. Its weaponry stands at an insane 8 battle cannons and 12 sets of twin-linked heavy bolters, not to mention a macro cannon. Typically, these are seen on Imperial starships. Despite their limited presence in terms of visibility, the squats were, in theory, a force to be reckoned with. But somewhere along the line, it's clear that things went badly wrong, perhaps relying on motorbikes too much. Yet they had a solid hand to play, yet rumours of mass extermination at the hands of the Tyranid persist, what exactly happened, no one truly seems to know. Because of the bizarre and abrupt abandonment of the squats during the period of 1st and 2nd to 3rd editions of 40k, it led to obvious questions about just what the hell had happened to the squats. There also remain questions about the early period for their civilization. In the sense that yes, the Squats did suffer the difficulty of what seems to be the Age of Strife as did all other human worlds, however it's phrased as saying the galactic core was cut off from the rest of human space. It speaks of warp storms, but that's really all. There's no mention of the calamitous war that nearly extinguished humanity entirely which preceded the Age of Strife. There's no mention of making an enemy of AI, and there's no mention of issues with psychers during the Age of Strife, although we already explained about potentially why that is. Instead, it was just this time of isolation, as the Squats refer to it. So, some integral events that dictate how or why certain things occurred for humanity are not spoken of in the available information we have related to the Squats and their own origins. And although a lot of that was not part of 1st edition, it definitely was part of 2nd. And I think a large reason as to why those explanations are not there is because we never got the first Squat Codex. So it's a fairly large missing piece of a puzzle, and I hope we get some threads of history that can be woven back into the larger lore tapestry of the 40k verse soon. Now importantly, in regards to the sudden disappearance of the Squat civilization, the long and short of it, as we looked at in the beginning, relates to this common theory surrounding an in-fiction demise of the Squats, said to have occurred at the claws and digestive acids of the Tyranids. A significant number of people now adhere to this as the default view, that at some point, which is poorly defined in the galactic timeline, the Tyranids swept through the Squat homeworlds in the western section of the Ultima Segmentum. No such recorded event in the history of the Imperium is stated anywhere, as it is more regularly noted to us. There's no record stated with regularity, or officially speaking to a Tyranid high fleet, obliterating an entire substantial civilization. It would be hard to miss, it's no small thing, especially when the Squat homeworld territory sits slap bang over critical Imperial planets and systems of considerable scale and consequential events in the existing 40k history. Badab, Katashan, it's near to or contains multiple space marine home planets. Oh, and you know, the Squat homeworlds also contain Octaria and Octarius. So a giant Tyranid hive fleet sweeping through and obliterating a civilization spanning a territory about as large as one quarter of the Segmentum Solar? It's the sort of thing that you very well might imagine would have been seen and recorded 
by more people somewhere. It would likely draw a fair bit of comment. And no, I don't think the current Tyranid situation with Octarius and Crippman has got anything to do with the squats. So where the hell does this Tyranid sweep fit into things? The answer is, it really doesn't. It doesn't make much sense at all. And the very unfortunate reason for this is it's pretty obvious why, that seemingly when the squats were erased from 2nd edition, the writers just couldn't be bothered to think of a reason for their exclusion, which led to this foaming at the mouth from the 40k community as early as 2nd edition as to just what the hell happened. For not the first time, the absurdity of where the solution would come from is as typical as it is ridiculous. We finally got this Tyranid theory in what essentially appeared to have been something that was an off-hand quip, a thought up on the fly flippant response to a reader's letter in an old US white dwarf mailbag, and it just stuck. The squats have been dealt from the start one of the rawest deals of any 40k faction. Forget about the Necrons being rejigged, forget about the Tau. For the squats, they got dealt a poor hand from the outset, and then without having a chance to really get any momentum, they were just erased. And the thinking seems to have been basically, Tyranids destroyed the squats? Sure, why not? Which I think actually is considerably annoying. Not to prevent anarchy in the comments, yes, it's true that there have been spoken references to squats and their ending here and there in some 40k novels, but these are not hard accounts. They're little more than rumours spoken by some who heard it from someone who heard it from someone. More importantly, these all came down the line after this offhand mailbag answer comment. So it appears as if the internal workings at GW basically thought, yeah, you know what, let's just go with the Tyranids. It's as good as anything else, and at the end of the day, who really cares? So even when such references appeared in more official fiction, it was more of a meme, a wink and a nod to readers, nothing that couldn't also be immediately dismissed as a drunken or crazed Voidfarer's story way down the line. It will be interesting, to say the least, to see just what is revealed to us when the squats do return, i.e., do we finally get some fleshed out lore to go along with them and join up all the, in my opinion, critical dots? Or will it be a half assed affair to just bring them back to the table, literally? In the interim between this and whenever the next edition of 40k is, of course. Major questions will likely be answered one way or the other though, such as, were they actually obliterated? If so, how? Plus, how do you explain the fact that their civilization sits right in the middle of some pretty important major imperial systems? Will we get answers to much more difficult unknowns such as when were they destroyed or if they weren't destroyed what happened were they never there properly to begin with my money is on the league of votan being a singular surviving collection of squats big enough to be a relevant minor faction but not enough to be what law suggests the squats were at the creation of the 40k verse the league of votan could even be perhaps an area colonized by squats which exists far from imperial periphery, say in the galactic east nearer to certain spheres of influence. But we're getting here into mad theoretical conspiracies if we go too far down that path. Objectively, trying to guess these things is pretty pointless at this stage, as you could think up an almost endless string of speculative answers to rationalise it all. Far easier to just wait and see how the squats are about to be reintegrated into the galaxy of the Imperium from both a view of historical timeline detail and a modern sense of their position in galactic affairs. What role or relationship will they have with the Imperium of Robert Gulliman, especially considering the catastrophic state of things and the Cicatrix Maledictum? What influence or relationship will they have with other Xenos? We simply have to wait and see. And then of course we have all the rumours that have floated around the Imperium for generations, that the squats were not in fact erased totally from existence. We have individuals seen on Necromunda, these were a great example. In fact, squats were encountered more recently as well in the Pariah Nexus, which actually fits in terms of the location of the squat homeworlds. The Nexus is on what would have been the southernmost edge where the squat homeworlds claim territory. One exploratory salvage ship of the Imperial fleet during its exploration of the Pariah Nexus sent a fragmented and garbled report stating, 42 days galactic of galactic core. We caught some form of weaponized gravitational field and interrogative. Cannot be. Official archival dogma that vessel belongs to squat. The last confusing thing to mention is that of the Demurg, or however the hell you say it. Now, despite references to them as being alien in origin and not classed as abhuman, this appears to be little more than humans of the Imperium incorrectly identifying the ships and crew of Demurg vessels. 
also likely because they were seen to have some affiliation with the Tau. It's very clear that the so-called Demur, Demurg, are essentially the Squats. Whether these are fleet-based potentially and left without a homeworld is unknown. It appears to have been something of an attempt in the past to resurrect the Squats, especially when noting that the term Demurg, Demurg, is derived from the ancient Greek meaning artisan or craftsman. But ultimately, this soft reboot of them was abandoned, or it didn't go anywhere. These Demurg emerged through the Battlefleet Gothic 40k adjacent game, and it was said that they had been seen with regularity in past centuries, linking between the Tau Empire on the eastern fringe of the galaxy, some communications of the Tau welcoming the Demur were seen, and you can well imagine that the Tau are very much within the scope of engagement of the Squats, not immediately hostile, generally reasonable and open to negotiation, far more than the Imperium. It also was suggested that there may have been a trade desire to capitalise on disruption even caused by Tyranid Hive Fleets, but that doesn't really sit with the Squats to me. The Demur class of vessel also should be noted as being titled Stronghold, and acted as a factory and processor vessels for a base of intersystem mining pods and haulage vessels. When observed, they were noted as disengaging relatively quickly if challenged, but also seemed to turn on attackers with surprising ferocity, especially in one instance where a Demurg vessel was challenged by orcs. Lastly, they were noted as having unusual technological skills, using electromagnetic fields to collect hydrogen and complex shielding that were not understood by Mechanicus assessment. In fact, squat terminology is all over the Demurg, Bastion vessels crewed by brotherhoods, and that Bastions might come together to defend these stronghold vessels. The Imperium is not said to have been able to inspect at close range these vessels, their origins, crew and capabilities remain unknown. However, the existence and situation of the Demurg could go some way to explaining how the Squats will fit into the picture of the modern period of the Imperium. Now, it will barely have escaped anyone's attention that recently it appears as if the Squats will return. Games Workshop played a fantastic April Fool's joke on everybody, but the Squats will no longer be known as such. They will now be known as the Leagues of Votan. Now, as I said, initially there was some confusion about this, but if you do know anything about the Squat lore, this makes perfect sense. The fact that the Squats are returning in some form is in itself actually not that interesting to me. It's fine that an ancient human faction are returning to the main timeline of 40k, it's fine. What interests me more is the possibility of filling in this considerable amount of blanks. And even if it doesn't happen initially, then there's still scope for it down the line. One worry though, is that despite say the Eldar Codex recently being absolutely heavy with page count, it wasn't as heavy on lore and did little to expand elements we were not already aware of, which was a bit disappointing. I think that obviously it won't be the case with the return of the squats because there's just too many important questions that have to be answered. You couldn't make it and omit that stuff, it would make no sense. So while speculation may be ultimately pointless, if I had to put money down, I'd be leaning on the League of Votan Squats being a bunch of strongholds from the old Squat homeworld civilization who saw the writing on the wall when whatever disaster befell their peoples. I'm guessing they basically said, we can't survive this, and decided to load up their ships with as much as they could and just get the hell out, moving as far away as was feasible. That's one possible option. Another could be that they were already separated from the home territory of the Squats, and that they existed as a League of Strongholds either outside of or on the periphery of Squat territory, and were simply missed when the destruction came. They've either laid low since, or were, who knows, cut off in another warp storm perhaps, and they're now seeking to regain, reconquer their territory. Maybe they know of the location of critical strongholds which have very important technology. It will also be interesting to see how it will all tie together the thread of the Demurg. Were these different fleet-based squads and not part of the League of Votan? How does that work? In many ways, the Demurg could be imagined as comparable to the story of the Homeworld game series, where a fleet of refugees seek a new homeworld. Also, where will the Squat's allegiance be? We know they worked in the past with the Eldar, but later came to view them as unreliable. There is reasonable evidence and suggestion that they have encountered, if not actively, worked with the Tau, and that's something which is more than plausible knowing the nature of the Squat's. Some rumours even persist to some of the Tau's fast development in technology being partially attributable to perhaps an alliance or trade dealings with squats. So really, there is a considerable amount of lore that needs to be unpicked and established. 
One thing I would feel confident about is the destruction of the squat homeworlds being attributed to the Tyranid because it really feels like they've gone all in on that at this point in time and honestly I feel a little conflicted about that. On the one hand it seems I guess plausible. We know that the Tyranids have been sending forces into the galaxy for some time long before it was initially thought and that they very well could have simply swept through and moved on or returned to a larger fleet. Who knows? The chances of there being any other explanation at this point seem unlikely and that is a little frustrating when you consider that, as I noted earlier, the original starting point for the explanation appears to have basically been someone saying, yeah, Tyranids killed the squats, why not, who cares? It just feels very annoying to know that such an important event in 40k was basically just some anonymous employee giving a flippant answer. And if you put that to one side, it becomes still more annoying when you consider that even after the fact, nobody thought enough of the squats lore within 40k to say, hang on, we can let that be a rumour, but also let's throw in some other rumours to keep them guessing. And when we figure out a really well-crafted end for the squat homeworlds that ties in with everything, well then we can just reveal it. But that doesn't seem to have been the way things have gone. It seems like everybody just said, Tyranids? Tyranids? Yeah, it's good enough, that'll do. It just personally feels like it kind of sucks. So strangely, this is why the squats release for me is actually kind of important. In fact, important for several reasons. The first is that, as I noted, I want gaps to be filled in to build a more complete picture. I also want some explanations for how there's so little recorded information about their collapse, despite the squat homeworlds being, as I explained earlier, slap bang in some of the most important and populated imperial areas of the galaxy. That's going to be a tough one to write round. The second is that the squats are perhaps one of the few factions in the galaxy you could likely class as the good guys. People are always asking, who do you root for in 40k? Who are the good faction? Because there's all these really horrible evil ones. And normally people say, there is no good factions in 40k. Or I tell people, well the good guys are actually the orcs, because for as warring and violent as they are, they're kind of lovably naive and they just kind of have a great time with whatever they're doing. Their outlook's always really sunny, and they don't really have some horrifying immoral agenda like many other factions. If the squats were back in the galaxy of M41, it would be very hard to not really see them as one of the better factions, morally speaking. They don't have much of the dystopian horror of the Imperium, they're not expansionist, they don't seek to exterminate others arbitrarily, they don't put skulls over everything, and they don't continually slaughter each other for suspicion of heresy or other trivial matters nor do they turn themselves into slave zombie machines in the form of servitors. There's a lot of good in the squats, and at this point it wouldn't be a bad thing even if the squats remain as this tiny, almost sub-faction. They would at least represent something like a glimmer of hope, a dying light of what humanity used to be, a small moat of the sad collapse of humanity and what it once was. I think that would be appropriately tragic for 40k, but still keep the foot in the door for anybody who held out hope that humanity somehow could be still redeemed. Lastly, the return of squats is important as it gives us possibilities for new technology and connections with other factions like the Tau. It also gives us potential for the Imperium to also unlock tech, perhaps ancient tech from its golden age. There are really so many directions that the squats could go in terms of how they're placed into the mosaic of the 40k verse. Quite honestly, I'm here for it, but I'm also pretty cautious about it. The reintegration of the squats after so long will require some really high-end writing to get right. It needs to be believably woven into the history of the galaxy, and many explanations have to happen to make it all plausible. And that's asking a lot. Will they achieve this? Any time will tell, but you better believe I'll be following this up when the time comes. Until then, we all await further updates from the League of Votan. I anticipate we're going to see many pictures until then, but not a lot of words. Lastly, I needed to just say, you know, commiserations Imperial Guard, sucks to not have a codex yet, not even before a faction that's been blanked for decades. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. So to finish today, let's talk about my next selection for Audible. 
My April recommendation is Binary Succession. Now you might be thinking to yourself, another short story Lutin? Well yes, because the longer narratives of 40k often contain interesting stories, I often find that the smaller narrative shorts are in fact really condensed versions, and you very often get just as much out of them as with larger narratives. Case in point, my recommendation a little while ago, First Lord of the Imperium a lot to digest in a very short time. Binary Succession also deals with a section of the timeline in 40k that I often seem to find people are not necessarily unfamiliar with, but not clear about either, along with just what was occurring in and around Terra during the Heresy. After Mars fell to the heretics early on in the Heresy, it left others of the Mechanicum isolated on Terra. And this is the location and focus for the story. It also paints a picture of the operation of the Imperium both now and into the future, especially in terms of its administration. One of my favourite elements of the 40k verse is discovering the operational nature and structure of the Imperium itself. It's often very vaguely defined because so much of the storytelling takes place out among the galaxy on distant worlds or ships of the Imperials or battlegrounds. When it comes to matters of the administratum or the legislative nature of the Imperium itself, again, we get snapshots and these tend to be of people at the highest echelons. This is not untrue also of binary succession, but it also gives us some sense of how the modern Imperium itself came to be, or at least the inception of it. And while humanity would suffer greatly in many millennia post-heresy, this one window paints quite a vibrant picture of the nature of human civilization into the distant future. It's only an hour long and it's far from combat heavy, but for me it's well worth a listen and I decided it was worthy of a recommendation, so I hope you will enjoy it. I myself already listened to it several times this week. As a final reminder, if you're new to all of this, you can start listening today with a free 30-day Audible trial and get full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals and podcasts included in the Plus catalogue. Try it yourself. Visit audible.com slash Lutin or text Lutin to 500 500. Thanks for your support as always and I'll see you in the next one.